Hi there. So today I'd like to talk to you about ray optics, an introduction to the idea of ray optics, and also discuss reflection and refraction. So we model light as a ray. Now what does that mean? First of all, light rays travel in straight lines through transparent media. And until the light encounters some kind of boundary or another material, it'll just keep traveling in that straight line. Now, the speed of light in a medium with index of refraction n is v is equal to c over n. So this means, of course, that the speed of light in a vacuum, which is c, or 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, is the fastest that light can travel, and that the index of refraction n is going to be a number that's greater than or equal to 1. It depends on many material properties, okay? But it's going to be a number that's greater than or equal to 1. So the speed of light within a medium will always be less than the speed of light in a vacuum. Another big assumption is that light rays can cross without disturbing one another. Now, this may seem counterintuitive if you know anything about interference, but for the topics that we're going to be dealing with, reflection, refraction, all that kind of thing, then this works very well. Okay. So basically the idea here is that if you have light ray 1 and light ray 2 and they cross at some point, but they won't disturb one another. Light ray 1 will keep going in this direction, and light ray 2 will keep going in this direction. Their frequency, their speed, none of that kind of stuff is altered. Finally, or next, light travels forever unless it runs into matter. Okay? When it does run into a material or it encounters an interface between media, it can be reflected, refracted, scattered, or absorbed. So those are the conditions. Finally, objects act as sources of light rays. Now, if you have a luminous object like the sun, this may seem very straightforward. Of course, the sun emits light. But somewhat less well understood is that if light reflects off a surface, like, say, me or a computer, then that object, me or the computer, acts as the source of light. Okay? So it doesn't really matter where the light initially came from. If it reflects off me, then I'm the source of light. But I'm not a luminous object. Okay, I just reflect light. We're going to use a lot of ray diagrams to represent what's going on and how images are formed in mirrors and lenses. So let's discuss them briefly for a second here. In a ray diagram, you let your light um, be drawn as arrows. Okay, so you show the direction of propagation of light with the head of the arrow. The lines of the light should be straight, of course, until they encounter a boundary or a medium change. So here, in this ray diagram, it's a nice one, right? Your light is represented by the red arrows. So you can see here that the tree is acting as the source of light um, in this. And we're trying to figure out and understand how this image of the tree is formed from the reflection of the light off the water. Okay, so we're going to draw eyes, typically, okay? An eye is typically drawn to see how the image is formed at a spot. Now, of course, if you have another person, say, standing a few meters down from person one, if you have person two standing a few meters away, or if person two is taller than person one, they will also see an image. But what we typically do in ray diagrams is we just focus, pardon the pun, on how the image is formed at uh, for one observer. Okay, And then if you wanted to explain a second observer, you would draw a second ray diagram. Understand intuitively that light is being emitted from the tree in all directions, okay? It's, some of the light is being emitted and it goes straight to the eye. It doesn't even reflect off the water. But if you're trying to explain the reflection, then you just need to draw the light rays that will help you understand that, okay? All right. So let's jump right in and start talking about the law of reflection. Reflection happens when you have light that's incident on a boundary between media, okay? So when light encounters a medium's boundary, it often reflects or bounces off of that boundary. When that happens, the law of reflection holds. The law of reflection says that the angle of incidence of the light, which means the angle that the incoming light makes with the surface normal, that has to equal the angle of reflection, which is the angle of that the light makes with the surface normal when it leaves, okay? So all of these angles are defined with respect to the surface normal. That's very important, 
you don't define the angle with respect to the object itself. And this is true for the law of reflection, and it's also true for refraction, which we'll talk about in just a second. Okay, so remember the surface normal points perpendicular to the plane of the surface. So sum up, law of reflection, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. Now this is always true, but it doesn't always make a pretty image or a pretty picture. When you have a really smooth object, like um, a mirror, or for example, a shiny metal, then you can get what's called specular reflection. When you have specular reflection, the angles, so for example, if you have light coming in, light rays coming in that are parallel to one another, as you see in this rainbow here, then when they reflect off of the surface, they're also parallel from one another. That's specular reflection, and it happens for smooth surfaces. So this is true, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, as you can see in specular reflection. This is also true for diffuse reflection. But what happens in diffuse reflection is your surface is rough. So for example, let's just take the curve of my hand as a bump on a surface. If the light comes in here and reflects, then my surface is kind of inclined this way, so my surface normal is here. So the angle of incidence, the angle of reflection might put the light going that way. If it comes on the top, right, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, but now my hand is this way, my surface normal is this way, so the light would go that way. And then over on this side, right, it would go at some crazy angle like that. So surface roughness causes light to be reflected in all kinds of directions, even if it comes in parallel to one another. And that's why you don't get pretty images formed from diffuse reflection, okay? All right, but let's talk about pretty images and plain mirror reflection and specular reflection for just a second more. Some of the nomenclature that we'll use here we'll also use in image formations from lenses and curved mirrors. So what we've got here is we have a mirror and let's say this is in the bathroom or something and somebody's put their medicine bottle on the counter in front of the mirror. Well, this is a typical everyday type experience. When you look in the mirror, you see an image of your pill bottle behind the mirror, right? Now, why is that? If you do the ray diagram, you can understand. So here, our pill bottle is acting as the source of light. We're gonna focus in, pardon the pun, on two points on the pill bottle, the top and the bottom, because this helps us understand what the image would look like. So we'll take the top as P prime and the bottom as P. So light is emitted from the top of the pill bottle. It strikes the mirror and is reflected back to your eye. Okay? Now it's also reflected in all kinds of other directions, but like I said earlier, we don't care about anything except what we observe from one observer, which hits the eye, okay? So you're gonna draw a ray that comes into the mirror and is reflected to the eye where the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, okay? And you can see that that's been done here with a blue arrow being represented of the light, okay? Now at the bottom of the pill bottle, the same thing happens, okay? Of course, the angles are different here because the pill bottle is in a different place. But the bottom of the pill bottle is in a different place with respect to the top, which makes the angles different, okay? But still, you have coming from point P, hitting point A here, okay, and then bouncing off to your eye, and the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. Okay, so that's what actually happens. But what happens is that your brain is kind of tricked here into thinking that the mirror itself is the source of light. When that happens, you can trace the origin, the apparent origin of those rays back by drawing here these dashed lines, okay, which go behind the mirror. That's where your brain thinks the pill bottle is, right, when it looks at the image. Okay, the same thing happens at the top and the bottom, so you can trace those back. And then what happens is an image of the pill bottle is formed called a virtual image, and it's virtual because it's behind your mirror, right? It's not a real image. So it's formed back behind the mirror, all right? Now, what'll happen is for plane mirrors, the, the true distance of the pill bottle to the mirror, between the pill bottle and the mirror, which we call S here, is going to be the same as the imaginary distance, I guess, of the pill bottle from the mirror's surface. So here, S and S prime are equal, okay? 
Also in a plane mirror, the height of the object will not change. So the true height of the pill bottle H will equal the apparent height of the image H prime. Okay, so that's what happens there. All right, so let's also talk about refraction. So refraction is described by Snell's law. So when light encounters a boundary between media, it doesn't just reflect, it can also refract, okay? Now, the amount of light that is reflected and refracted is dependent upon a lot of different things, including what the indices of refraction of the media are and the angle of incidence, okay? We're not really going to discuss how much of the light is reflected and refracted. Just understand that both can occur. So when light encounters a boundary between the media, it can be bent as it's transmitted through that boundary, and that's refraction. So you can see here that the light ray traveling from medium 1 with index of refraction N1, it encounters that difference in media at the boundary between N1 and N2. Here we're assuming the indices of refraction are different, and then that causes the path of the light to be bent okay, and change its angle. So Snell's law says that N1 sine of theta 1 is equal to N2 sine of theta 2, where N1 and N2 are the indices of refraction, and theta 1 and theta 2 are the angles that the light makes with respect to the surface normal. It's very important to remember that theta 1 and theta 2 are defined with respect to the surface normal and not the boundary between the media. Indices of refraction, as I stated earlier, are always going to be greater than or equal to 1. 1 is the index of refraction for a vacuum, and the index of refraction for air is really close, okay? So it's 1.0003, basically, okay? So it's really close to index of refraction for a vacuum. But if you have something else like water, its index of refraction is about 1.33, or 1 and a third, and glass, lots of glasses, are about 1.5, okay? Remember that when the index of refraction changes, that changes the speed of the light within that medium according to the equation V is equal to C over N. Let's do an example problem for refraction. Here you have a fish 20, meter, 20 meters from the shore of a lake, and a bonfire is burning on the edge of the lake nearest the fish. So does the fish need to be shallow or very deep to see the light from the bonfire? And what's the deepest or shallowest that the fish can be and still see light from the fire? Okay, now I'm going to warn you before I show you my solution, I am not a good artist, okay? But here we go. Here's my sketch. I told you it was bad. In this case, I've shown the lake with a wavy blue line. So there's my water, okay? And then I show the shore as this sort of black, unfinished rectangle thing over here. So there's the shore. And then I have my bonfire in red here on the edge of the lake, okay? right on the edge of the shore, I mean. Okay, so what I've drawn here in this little picture is light coming from the top of my bonfire. If it's a nice big bonfire, let's say that it's about a meter off the ground to the top, right? And let's say that my bonfire started about a meter from the shore. So that would mean that my light, um, as it travels down uh, to the water, would be making it about a 45 degree angle, say, with both the water and the surface normal, okay? Now, when that light encounters the boundary in between the water and the air, it's refracted, and it's bent, like so. Now, I don't know what this angle theta 2 is, okay? Um, but what I can tell you is that my fish is about 20 meters away from the shore. That was given to me in the problem, all right? So if I know theta 2, then I can use trigonometry and solve for how deep the fish has to be if it's 20 meters away from the shore, all right? So that's the strategy. For solving this problem. So here's my Snell's law. N1 sine theta 1 is equal to N2 sine theta 2. I've already shown you that um, air is about 1 for its index of refraction. I'm not going to take the 1.0003 out for this problem because my percent error isn't very important here. I just need to know if it's deep. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here I'm calling N1 1 and the angle theta 1 45 degrees. So I have 1 times sine of 45 degrees equals and then the index of refraction for medium 2, which is water, is about 1.33. So I plug that in there, 1.33 times sine of theta 2. And I solve for theta 2. When I get theta 2 by taking the inverse sine, right, then I end up with um, 32 degrees. Okay, so that means that my theta 2, as it's drawn here, 
is 32 degrees. So I break that out into another little triangle. So if I have 32 degrees here, the depth I called it D, and then the um, lower axis, which is the distance of the ship, uh, of fish from the shore, is 20 meters. So if I do the tangent of 32 degrees, then that would give me 20 meters over my depth. So when I solve for my depth there, um, I get 32 meters. Well, that's pretty deep, okay? That's not very shallow at all. So I call the answer to the first part of this question, the fish has to be deep, okay? Now, the second part said, what's the deepest or the shallowest it can be, okay? So if the answer is deep, then basically I'm trying to solve for as the shallowest that the fish can be and still see that bonfire. Okay, I do that here on this next slide. So what that would mean is that the fish is seeing just the very bottom of the bonfire, maybe. Okay. Well, if it's seeing just the very bottom of the bonfire, then the angle of incidence here, or theta 1, is about 90 degrees, right? Because your, your light would be coming from very near the ground, okay, just skimming the surface of the water, okay? And that is a 90 degree angle with respect to the surface normal. And then it would be refracted down, and I, again, calculate theta 2. So here I've got um, n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2, okay? So, of course, n1 is 1, and then sine of theta 1 would also be 1, okay? So that means that sine of theta 2 would have to be 1 over 1.33. And so to find theta 2, I take the inverse sine of 1, point, 1 over 1.33, and I get about 49 degrees there, okay? Now, repeating what I just did a second ago, if I take the inverse, um, or if I take the tangent of 49 degrees, then that would give me 20 meters over my depth, and that should be as shallow as it can possibly be and still see some of the fire. When I solve for that, I get a depth of about 17.5 meters, okay? So that's as shallow as the fish can be and still see the fire. Okay, before I leave off with refraction altogether, I got to talk about total internal reflection. So let me describe that here. If light's traveling from medium one to medium two, and the index of refraction of medium one is greater than medium two, then light in an angle greater than what we call the critical angle will all be reflected and not refracted. And that's total internal reflection. It's total internal because it keeps the light inside of the media, so it's still internal to the medium, and it's reflection because, of course, that means all the light's reflected and none is refracted. Now, the critical angle, which I call theta sub c here, is at the limit where theta 2 is 90 degrees, okay? So that's shown here in this little um, diagram. So, for example, if you don't have total internal reflection and you still have some refraction, then you might get this case here on the left, okay? You have the angle of incidence and you have your angle of refraction and it obeys Snell's law. But if you're at that critical angle, then what that would mean is that if the light is refracted, it's refracted at a 90 degree angle, okay? So that the light just skims the surface, okay? So that defines your critical angle because basically light's not escaping the medium at that point where the angle is 90 degrees when it's refracted. So we can then solve for theta critical. If we plug in n1 sine of theta critical equals n2 sine of 90 degrees. Of course, the sine of 90 degrees is 1. So then when we solve for theta critical, we get theta critical is equal to the inverse sine of n2 over n1. Now, you get total internal reflection at the critical angle or at angles greater than the critical angle. So if theta 1 is greater than theta critical, greater than or equal to theta critical, you have total internal reflection. Now also note that if medium 1 has an index of refraction that's less than medium 2, then you can't get total internal reflection. It will not occur. Just mathematically, if you think about signs, that's the truth. Now, the most important application of total internal reflection is in fiber optics. So fiber optics have um, mostly replaced metal wire for transmission of digital signals. So what you have in a fiber optic is a core of a special glass that's surrounded by a layer of glass cladding, or a, an envelope, if you will. And of course, the index of refraction for the core has to be greater than the index of refraction for the cladding to get it to work. Another importance of applying the cladding is it's protective. 
If you didn't do that, then sure, maybe you'd still get total internal reflection from your core. But then if anything happened, if your core got scratched or damaged in some way, which of course in any real application it eventually would, then light would leak out and you'd lose signal and that would be bad. So that's another reason to have the cladding because it's protective, okay? So the glass core and the frequency of the light are chosen such that very little is light um, is absorbed by the fiber. And this makes the signal loss very small, even over large distances. So let's do one more example problem before we leave off with this lecture. The glass core of an optical fiber has an index of refraction of 1.6. The index of refraction of the cladding is 1.48. So what's the maximum angle a light ray can make with the wall of the core if it's to remain inside the fiber? Okay, so here we go. Theta critical is equal to the inverse sine of the ratio of the indices of refraction, which here are 1.48 divided by 1.6. When you solve for that, you get 68 degrees. But that's not what the problem's asking, okay? You have to be careful. Remember, the angles for Snell's law are defined with respect to the surface normal, not the surface. And so that means that in order to get the angle with the core, you have to do 90 degrees minus the 68 degrees that we just solved for, which gives you, of course, 22 degrees. All right, I hope you understood. And um, if you didn't, remember, you can always pause me at any time. Think for a second before moving on, and I'll see you around, okay?